Okay, so I think we're going to start. Um, everybody knows today is uh, the other Windrush, and um, I've been very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Maria del Pilar Caladine organize this all for me. Um, she's the, uh, the editor, of course, of the book. So I've had a very lazy Guyana Speaks month. Um, where I haven't really had to do anything. So I just want to say thank you so much, uh, Maria, for agreeing to do um, organizing everything for me today and huge congratulations on the publication of the book, The Other Windrush. And just so everybody is familiar exactly with who you are, I want to just say that um, Maria is an associate fellow at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, University of London. Her academic work focuses on colonial literature about the indenture system in Guyana and her book, With Eyes of Wonder, Colonial Writing on Indentured Indians in British Guyana, 1838 to 1917, is forthcoming with Liverpool University Press. She is the co-editor of We Mark Your Memory, Writing from the Descendants of Indenture, University of London Press, 2018 and Memory, Migration, Decolonization in the Caribbean and Beyond. With, um, that's also the University of London Press 2020. And of course, um, this, The Other Windrush is the latest book that she's worked on. She co-edited it with um, David Dabadine and also has a, a chapter of her own in this. Um, and I just want to plug it straight away and say it's available from Pluto Press for 9.99. And I have no doubt after you've all heard from Maria and all the other amazing people who have contributed to it that um, you will want to get your own purchases. So yeah, Maria, you're very, very welcome. Over to you. Thank you so much. And um, I wanted to pass on your thanks because um, I've got to say that the other panelists make this so easy for me every time I ask them to be involved in something from their contribution to the book to an event um, about it. So I kind of feel like I haven't had to do much organizing either and um so i i embrace your thanks and kind of pass them on to mr g and gordon and laney and ellie and david uh, thank you so much for for being here today and nalini who has had to get up at silly o'clock in toronto to be with us today thank you nalini um, <laughs> <laughs> um so i wanted to just uh, i've got a little excerpt from the introduction i thought we could all just read a little bit from our chapters just to give you a flavour of the book. Um, not all of the contributors are, are here today, but um, that's good because, I mean, we want you to buy it. <laughs> You're not going to buy it if we give it all away. Um, so I wanted to start just with uh, a small excerpt from the introduction um, uh, to give you an idea of what our approach was um, and how we got here from the work that David and I have um, done on indenture. David, for many more decades, um, than me, how we got to this moment of, of um, focusing on the other wind rush. Despite the strong sense of Caribbean identity that connects the contributors to this book, many of us have experienced throughout our lives the blank looks of those who have struggled to place us when we respond to that most loaded of questions, where are you from? Far too few people in the United Kingdom know about the system of indenture in the Caribbean and the people of Chinese and Indian descent that it left there. Fewer still are aware that alongside African Caribbean people, the descendants of these indentured laborers form part of the Windrush generation of migrants from the region to Britain between 1948 and 1971. While this book reflects on the challenges experienced by a community who have effectively lived their lives as a minority, a minority within a minority, it's also a celebration of what has been made possible in spite of our invisibility to the general public and through the creative ways we have resisted the silence that surrounds our cultural history. Within decades of the inception of indenture, a minority of Chinese Caribbean and Indian Caribbean people were able to access schools and liberate their children from the plantation system. In a few cases, they were able to go overseas for tertiary education. Accordingly, even before Indian Caribbean migrants left the region as part of the Windrush generation, an Indian Guyanese man named William Hewley Wharton had completed his study of medicine at the University of Edinburgh in 1899. 
the Chinese Trinidadian bacteriologist Joseph Lennox Parwan, whose work on rabies had global significance, also studied at Edinburgh University, completing his degree in 1912. Achievements like this are likely to have been a source of inspiration to others who saw in Britain a place where they might access higher education and wider opportunities. And there is no doubt that these ideas filtered down to many in the Windrush generation. But despite the fact that they have emerged from a little known community, descendants of indenture have participated in the formation of a British Caribbean identity from the earliest moments of their arrival. It is widely recognized that the National Health Service is indebted to the workers of the Windrush generation and a number of contributors to this book had relatives or parents who worked in the NHS. Indian Trinidadian novelists, Samuel Selvon and V.S. Naipaul, who both arrived in the UK in the 1950s, ignited literary fires that inspired later Windrush writers like David Dabdi, whose poetry volume, Cooley Odyssey, is a journey into the double migration of Indian indenture and Windrush. Dabdi's work as an academic and writer was made possible not only by the creation of the Centre for Caribbean Studies at Warwick, but also through the establishment of publishing houses which supported the work of Caribbean writers and scholars. Jeremy Pointing's Leeds-based People Tree Press, for example, published work by Ch Chinese Guyanese writers Jan Lo Scheinborn and Mei Ling Jin. People Tree's contribution to Indian Caribbean literature through the publication of authors both in Britain and the Caribbean is unparalleled. Indian Guyanese Windrusher Arif Ali, who founded Hansi Publications in 1970, played an important role in the academic development of Indian Caribbean studies. In 1987, Hansi published the groundbreaking India in the Caribbean and Benevolent Neutrality, Indian, Indian Government Policy and Labour Migration to British Guyana. Yet beyond educational institutions, Roy Saw and barrister Rudy Narayan, whose life journalist Lady Mulcahy reflects upon in this anthology, focused on work that can be interpreted as expressions of solidarity with African Caribbean communities who bore the brunt of the institutional discrimination that marked life in the UK in the 1970s and 80s. Roy Saw, through his public speaking at Hyde Park between 1958 and 1989, and Rudy Narayan through his legal work from his offices in Brixton. In 2018, the 17th anniversary of the arrival of the Empire Windrush was marred by revelations that elderly, elderly and vulnerable members of the Windrush generation were wrongly threatened with deportation and incorrectly moved from the UK. The justifiable public outrage over these events surprised the current government, whose creation of an annual Windrush Day was interpreted by many as a hasty scramble to repair the severely damaged public relations that resulted from these tragic events. Both the anniversary and the scandal have prompted a movement towards a wider understanding of the Windrush generation and its lesser known histories. The Migration Museum's 2017 exhibition, No Turning Back, displayed the family history of one storyteller who was both a descendant of Indian indentured laborers and the child of a Windrush migrant. The British Library's online exhibition, Windrush Stories, includes accounts of the experiences of descendants of indenture and Charlie Brinkhurst Cuff, Mother Country, Real Stories of the Windrush Children, contains, contains essays by Windrush children of Chinese, Indian and Jewish descent. While this anthology focuses on the mobilities and migrations triggered by the creation of the system of indenture, in the case of Guyana, the indigenous people of Amerindian heritage also migrated to the UK as part of the Windrush generation. Notable examples include the father of the writer Pauline Melville and the artist George Simon. Speaking about the first generation of Indian indentured laborers to the Caribbean, historian Clem Citran has used the term collective amnesia to describe the community's silent agreement to forget the complex reasons that motivated each individual departure from India. The work of historians focusing on these various push factors tells us, tell us that these could include poverty, famine, and domestic violence. John Lo, Jan Lo Scheinborn's excellent novel, The Last Ship, is an exploration of the roots and consequences of similar modes of forgetting in a Chinese Guyanese family. As far as the children of the other Windrush are concerned, 
These first generation silences could sometimes be fortified by their own parents' reticence to discuss their early lives in the UK in order to shield their children from painful stories of discrimination. While understanding their origins, this book seeks to challenge these silences, sharing aspects of the stories of our parents, grandparents and great grandparents, and showing how much our own lives have been defined by the bravery that mo motivated their multiple journeys and their lives. The seeds of this anthology were sown in 2017 when the editors convened an oral history panel at the University of London. Sharing aspects of her father's voyage across the Atlantic with the audience, Heidi Safia Mertzer reflected on what this meant for her as a descendant of indenture and a daughter of a Windrush era migrant. My father's journey, said Heidi Safia Mertzer, made me who I am. One cannot look upon her work as an academic who has sought to expose the injustices encountered at the intersections of race and gender and not immediately understand that her comment encapsulates the understanding that at its best to be part of the Windrush generation was to belong to a community of resistors whose support for one another operated in defiance of the hostile environment recounted in these pages. Um, so I want to introduce um, a wonderful gentleman who is Gordon Warnick, um, who is going to read from, sorry, I should have had that up. My brother's gonna be really upset with me because that's my brother holding me there. Um, I should have had that up while I was reading my chapter. Um, so Gordon Warnick is gonna read from his chapter, um, Pepper Pot. And uh, I want to say um, that Gordon has been um, very generous in, um, um, in giving me his time um, and in working very, the other writers will not mind if I say this because it's just a reflection of kind of, I think of how keen he was to share the story. He was the first one to get his, <laughs> to get his article in. And uh, um, I think that you will all um, appreciate the excerpt that he's gonna share with us now. Uh, Gordon, you're on um, mute at the moment. Thank you. You missed the most important part of my speech then. Okay, <laughs> I'll start. Again. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you very much, Maria. Lovely to see all of you. Uh, I'm going to read a, a short extract from my, my chapter for what it is. Uh, it's called Pepper Pot. Um, if you fall asleep, um, please wake up. Okay, here we go. Pepper Pot. May 1994, BBC House. Shepherd's Bush Green, London. My agent has sent me to audition for a role in EastEnders. An arranged marriage is the plot line. Now there's a surprise. And it's only six episodes. I'm sitting in the foyer waiting to go in. I look up at a screen and watch Julia Smith, the producer of EastEnders, talking about the imminent 10 year anniversary of the show. I was never a fan of EastEnders and working in the sterile environment of a studio TV studio for a few weeks on something I don't care for is giving me huge reservations about going through with the audition. Balls to this, I'm thinking. I stand up, ready to walk out of the door and go home when someone calls me in for the audition. We exchange pleasantries and this is followed by a half-hearted reading by me for the part I'm up for. I'm asked what my heritage is. When I started out in the business, I lied about where my parents came from as I was often only seen for Asian parts. I kept quiet about my dad being a white German and told a lie about my mother coming from India. But for the past couple of years, I have decided to tell the truth. I was born in Highgate, North London. My father comes from Germany and my mother comes from Guyana in South America. Her grandparents came from Northern India. This is met by furrowed brows and an awkward silence from the three jolly white BBC people auditioning me. There is a long pause. Then one of them says, but you do have Asian friends, don't you? 12th of August, 1873, my great grandfather leaves India for Guyana. Emigrant pass 4103. My great-grandfather, Mangal Singh, came from Awa, now Awan, a village near Asmara, Uttar Pradesh, in the far north of India. His caste de designation was Chutri, and he was from a high or warrior caste. His family were probably landowners or rulers. 
During the 19th century, Uttar Pradesh had seen a lot of political unrest, and this may have been why my great grandfather chose to leave India, a chance for other opportunities and a better life. Mangal Singh sailed without his family from Calcutta to Burbese, British Guyana, on the ship Sussex. My great grandfather was probably considered a big man with a commanding presence because, as the ship's log shows, he was given the role of Siddhar on the boat. Now, this meant that he was put in charge of 25 fellow emigrants. Once he had arrived in Guyana, he worked on a sugar plantation in Port Morant, Burbese, where, again, he was made a Siddhar. Siddhars could be respected, but they were also often feared and hated. They were the buffer between the white overseers and the cane cutters and weeders on the plantation. My great grandfather would have benefited from having access to the overseas world and he would have learned English. 12th of February, 1872, Calcutta. My great grandmother leaves India for British Guyana, emigrant pass 453. At the age of nine, my great grandmother to be, Lil Money, left her village, Satya, with her family. Satya was in Poonuli, a district in northern India. They departed from Calcutta on the boat Pune, a year before my great grandfather, her future husband, left India. On arrival, her family was sent to work on a sugar plantation in Smithfields, close to Port, close to Port Morant. After their indenture, they stayed and opened a grocery shop. When my great grandfather's indenture was over, he purchased land, prospered, and eventually met Leal Money. Mungo and Leal Money had six children and all had Christian and Indian names. It was Mungo's decision to have his children marry in a Christian church, and they all became converts, meaning that they would be above the other villagers. This may explain my mother's attitude when she lived in England. 8th of May, 1923, Letterkenny, Guyana, my mother is born. When I started out in the business, I lied about my parents, where they came from. I was often only seen for Asian parts, so I kept quiet about my dad being white German, said that my mother came from India. At the time, I felt no guilt about distorting the facts. I was young and eager to get the work, and physically, I knew I fitted the bill. Only later on did I realise that what I could bring to a part, irrespective of what my true nationality was, was more important. My mother Iris was raised in Letterkenny, Burbese, British Guyana, by her parents Angelina Mangal Singh and Thomas Brian Budu. The house she grew up in was like a long white box with a series of lattice shutters. It was built on a slender wooden stilt as the local area was prone to flooding. It was bought, my, bought by my great grandfather and given to my grandfather as a dowry when he gave Angelina away. Iris was the youngest of eight children. She, had, she and her brother Walter, the second youngest, were doted upon by their older siblings who became the surrogate parents when Angelina and Thomas died in the children's early teens. Life became hard for the family. Unemployment in the villages was high and Iris's chances of marrying a suitable young man and starting a family, something expected of her at the time, were very slim. The siblings had all been to school and were very involved in the Christian church. As they lived among Hindu and Muslim farmers, there were a few suitors for the Badus. Also, the custom of having an adequate dowry hampered the Badus' attempts to make suitable matches. My mother worked as a secretary for a small accounting firm in Burbese. She saved her earnings while her elder sisters, very involved with the church, kept the house running and remained watchful over Iris. One of her brothers was director of the Rice Producers Association. Another brother drank heavily and gambled a lot. He died in his late 50s, having literally drunk himself to death. As with many women in Guyana at the time, her life was very restricted. Most of her friends either moved to Georgetown or went overseas to live with relatives. Both my mother and her youngest brother, Walter, had plans to fly the nest, and Walter was the first to do so leaving for America in 1948 to study mathematics at Howard University. My mother was in her late 20s when she left to start a new life in England in 1954. Together with her savings, money from her brother Walter in America meant that she was able to fly to England with her close friend Annie. It must have been a big step for Iris and Walter to leave such a close-knit family, but they all wished her the best, knowing that both she and Walter 
had been desperate to get out. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much, Gordon. I'm sure you'll get okay. questions at, um, at the end of that. Um, uh, I want to introduce my, my colleague of 12, 13 years, uh, Nalini Mohabir, um, who I had the pleasure to meet when she was here in the UK um, doing her PhD. Um, and we have maintained our, um, our friendship and our comradeship through all of those years. And uh, I remembered when we, David and I, uh, were at the stage where we were thinking about who we would invite to write for this book. I remember a story that Nalini had told me and she's going to share with you today, which is that before her parents had migrated to Canada, they had spent some time in the UK. Um, I remember her also, before I, I saw, before I laid eyes on this photo, I remember Nalini talking about it. So I'm gonna pass her over to you now and she's gonna read an excerpt from her chapter, Made Through Movement. Thanks, Maria. And thank you to David as well for, um, for inviting me to contribute to this landmark volume. Thank you to Anita for providing this forum for us and to all the other contributors. It's lovely to meet you, at least virtually. Um, so just the context for this, as Maria said, is uh, my both my parents' uh, migration from the Caribbean to the UK and then onwards to Canada, but primarily through my mother. Sailing from Port of Spain to Southampton, she stands alone at the docks, suitcase in hand. In Trinidad, she's a salesperson. In Britain, she'll train to be a nurse. A subsequent migration to Canada, however, proves that career elusive. Qualifications not recognized as a result of crossing an ocean, she'll become a retail worker yet again. Hundreds of Caribbean women made momentous journeys during the middle decades of the 20th century from places deemed small-ish. But what do maps know? You've seen these women in their worn coats and black orthopedic shoes, plastic bags at their feet, standing on the subway platform in London, New York, Toronto. They're on their way home after another long shift in a service industry, retail, food, home care. This is my mother's story of migration from Trinidad to England to Canada, entwined with my father's, my aunties and mine. What follows is a brief reflection on an interview I conducted with my parents. And then the interview itself is about my parents' Windrush era migration from the Caribbean to the UK, or rather how they recount their memories of migration to me, their daughter. My mother's hands are an ocean, but only a generation away from hard work in the fields. Unlike me, whose only field work has been that of academic tourism and travel to the archives. I first interviewed my mother for a stage production at Leeds a decade ago. Produced by Carol Marie Webster, the piece was entitled Mother Libation in commemoration of mothering in the African diaspora. My inclusion in this kind of production is perhaps only possible in the UK, a site where ex-colonials encounter each other and creolization takes on the form of political blackness. I was also asked to participate as someone of Indian Caribbean descent because we've been positioned in relation to African Caribbean experiences since our arrival in the region. We come to know ourselves to the complexity of stories emanating from the womb of the Caribbean and her diaspora. My mother's story was not easy to come by as it emerged slowly on a need to know basis, as in, child, why you ask me that? I was first motivated because I wanted to know more about her relationship with Auntie Myrtle, who's the first woman in the, uh, in the photograph. A friendship sustained across borders for over 50 years. Each year without fail, Auntie Myrtle posts Christmas presents from London, socks and scarves from Marks and Spencer for me, tea and biscuits for my parents. 
And when I moved from Toronto to Leeds to pursue graduate studies, my mother informed me Auntie Myrtle would be my mom away from home. And she was. And that's my, my mother, uh, who's the third woman in the, in the photograph. My mom, Amarin, grew up in the south of Trinidad, Separia, where she went to a school run by Canadian Presbyterian missionaries. Since she was Muslim, she also attended the masjid and received Arabic lessons, but her parents made sure she went to other religious services too. The daily lived experience of creolization, of intermixture and enrichment in Trinidad meant she also attended the Pentecostal church, spiritual Baptist ceremonies and the Hindu mandir. Trinidad might be a small island, but it contained a world. In 1965, at the age of 25, her world widened. She stood at the docks of Port of Spain with carloads of family, aunts, uncles, sisters, cousins, nieces, and nephews who had traveled from all corners of the island to say farewell, perhaps sensing her departure would be without a return. My older cousin told me that as a young girl, her dreams expanded thanks to seeing my mother board the ship alone. Mom was the first to leave Trinidad. Like many women from the Caribbean, marriage and work wasn't an either or choice. And her aspirations weren't confined to wife or mother. She was seeking an education and career in England. She broadened all our horizons. When my mother arrived in England, the hospital was supposed to send someone to pick her up, but they forgot. So she hitched a ride with an ambulance the matron was apologetic and offered my mom, who'd been traveling all day on an empty stomach on the rail, pork and beans. Luckily, before any unease set in, she met Auntie Myrtle. Myrtle was my mother's nursing college roommate, and they shared a sparse room with two beds in a dorm. Myrtle had arrived three years earlier from Barbados and had an older sister in London who provided a nurturing lifeline of pepper sauce, plantain, peas and rice delivered on the weekends to Auntie Myrtle and mom. I have a feeling this might have made up for the pork. Myrtle taught my mom and her fellow nurses from the Caribbean how to shop, travel and negotiate freedoms and restrictions in this new place. The four women in the photo are from Barbados, Grenada, Trinidad, and Jamaica, respectively. They were part of a workforce of colonials and ex-colonials invited to work in Britain, but who nevertheless were racialized as migrant workers, needing their visa renewed every six months. They overcame obstacles through a sort of communal defense fortified by friendship. Plus they knew how hard each other had to work to achieve their dreams. But how did they not only survive, but thrive? Well, they found time, time to be young and alive, to date, to dress up, to sip tea like Caribbean queens at Harrods, and I imagine to dance, not necessarily to the mighty sparrow, but a little wine to Tom Jones, the Beatles, whatever else moved the dance clubs of Reading. But most of all, they survived through the lessons learned in the Caribbean about solidarity, kinship, and living with difference. In 1968, all four women pictured received their state enrolled nursing certificate. And um, I think I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Nalini. That was really beautifully read. Thank you very, very much. Um, I've got a prize winning writer. I've got two prize winning writers, Ellie, Ellie Nyland and uh, David Dabbling. So I put them consecutively. Um, so Ellie, is Ellie, are you unmuted Ellie? I can't see you. Have we got Ellie? I can't see Ellie. And have we lost Ellie? You know what we could do? I can try and get Ellie back if we've okay. lost her. But if David, um, if David, David, could you read for us just while I'm, um, I'm trying to track down Ellie? Have we lost Ellie as well? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, well, I'm sure David's there. Let's have a look. Let's see yeah. where David is. David. Am I here? You are there. Good, good, Yay. good. <laughs> I, um, David, can I ask you just to go before Ellie because I we can't find her. Oh, Ellie's here. 
Ellie's here. So, um, Ellie, if you could, sorry, if you could kindly unmute. I thought I lost you. Oh, so let me see. I'm going to ask Ellie to unmute just to turn her microphone on. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Right. <laughs> Shall I read now? Please, yeah. Okay. This short quote is just the beginning of from BG to GB. Traveling is a brutality. It forces you to trust strangers and to lose sight of all that familiar comfort of home and friends. It was the worst of times, a period of racial unrest, adding to uprisings and upheavals that began after independence when British Guyana was renamed the Republic of Guyana. The seeds of catastrophe were sown and long lines of trucks carried armed militia throughout the country. There were murders, riots, rapes, racial strife and food shortages. Disquiet spread like malarial mosquitoes. For seven months, radio broadcasts relayed the outbursts of violence countrywide. Then, after protests and petitions failed, the British troops arrived. I guessed years later that in the midst of nationwide turmoil, my father had calculated the probability of a safe life under Burnham, the new dictator, and reached a poor prognosis, the only available serum was emigration. Although memories discolor with age, this one revisits like a lingering ghost. It was a Wednesday when mommy said, a letter came, your daddy in England wants you to live with them. No school today, we have things to do. I looked at her astonished. When? Why? was all I could think to ask about this unexpected news. A vaccination for measles, a dental hygiene certificate, and various other documents were required before I could cross the ocean to where the Queen and our rulers lived. A visit to the bank was necessary too, as I was allowed to leave with five pounds. The transaction officially stamped onto a page of my passport, which also stated that I was four foot six and a half inches tall and 13 years old. What a hectic time it must have been for mommy with many other young children to care for. But the following week was full of excitement for me. Even now, 53 years later, I remember my first ferry ride on the Torani with mommy. Its horn bellowed, it belched smoke. The race of water on the Burbis River was magical and it whipped up furious fans of foam. I could barely contain my rapture. After collecting my visa from the British Embassy in Georgetown, we went to book a stores where green cloth for my dress, orange cotton gloves, white slingback Cuban heel shoes, and a new towel and a comb were bought for my trip. A pair of gold bangles were a special gift from mommy. I marveled at the statues and traffic lights, and I drank a whole bottle of Pepsi. It was the best of times. But a young gullible me never knew I'd feel homesick. Never knew that after a wet-eyed departure from Atkinson Airfield in Georgetown, on board a monarch aeroplane with a pumpkin-colored crown, that I would spend so many years yearning for my mother and siblings, or that this would be a voyage without return. I only knew that I wanted to see my daddy, to call him daddy, and that I was going to live with him in England. I'd witnessed him beating my mother, seen her laying helpless, bruised and weeping. And yet, despite his mistreatment of us both, 
images of his black and white brogue shoes. His shining Raleigh bicycle and Wellington boots had not blurred. I loved him. He was a handsome school headmaster whose hair and handwriting I, I admired. I was sure to go on a red double-decker bus with him, and I would also see Buckingham Palace. I arrived to a blizzard of unknown faces. Among the many things which seemed strange to me amidst the dense crowds and the immense airport was the worry that I'd forgotten what my daddy looked like. Somehow it seemed easier to picture a palace and snow-covered holly trees with berries, but his face eluded me. And his house was large with carpet on every floor, somehow eerie at first because I was used to the slap of feet on floors. and children beating up and down wooden steps. But here, the people's feet made no sound. A bathtub with hot running water was new and fascinating. I now had a stepmother and three new siblings, as well as my own room with my own bed and a desk and a wardrobe. And the room was silent, except for a bubble of voices coming from the black and white television set downstairs, which became a consuming interest of mine. I found the advertisements especially entertaining. There were many novelties to enjoy. Every Saturday night, my daddy made hot dogs with fried onions and Pepsi was served. On Sunday mornings, he'd cook breakfast and lunch and would invite friends to come over. I enjoyed adding sugar to my tea and carnation evaporated milk to my coffee. And I'd accompany daddy to the supermarket and to the laundrette. And in the cold, in the season of darkness, I saw newly naked trees. And it was fun to breathe through my nose and mouth, at the same time exhaling vapor. Although homesickness was kicking in and I missed my best friend Margaret, school was safer, at least. The only thing to sting my ears was the cold. There were no sharp tongues, no wild canes or painful ruler wax on the knuckles when I was late and no more sadistic schoolmasters when I did not satisfy some homework requirement or other. I no longer needed to fear authority, and I found some grit. However, my intellectual disability regarding numbers meant I sought to flee the intolerable mathematical monotony and the wall of thorns that was geometry, algebra, and the rest. Indifferent to failure, I limped through lessons, I dawdled between classes and increasingly began leaving school. Sometimes visiting the library, window shopping or roaming aimlessly. But my favorite place to skulk was always Tooting Market. To a truant age 15, the market seemed, the, the market teemed with life and laughter. I loved the cussing parrot known as Mr. Mac, who greeted customers with pay me five bob and big batty buy. I watched the peddlers. I entered bakeries and bookshops without challenge, even though I wore my school uniform. This bustling place was full of chaos and color. It was like a balm. All of that on the Calypso music added to the melody of rich, airy Caribbean voices. Apart from the feast from my eyes and ears, there was a scent of flowers, the aroma of sweetbread and seasoning, and new handkerchiefs, 
I marveled at the gaudy clothes on sale and the noise of people higgling or bartering. It gave me a surge of contentment. Letters from Mommy would arrive, full of advice. But opening them was like reopening a wound. I was homesick, but I didn't know what for. Was it the longing for familiar things, the Indian films at the Gaiety Cinema, or the sound of church bells? The sound of warm rain as it pelted and glinted on the zinc rooftops and afterwards gleamed in puddles? Or was it the smell of fried callaloo and shrimps while mass pot, while Ma's pot spoon stirred and scraped the sides of her black karahi, a black iron, cast iron karahi? I'd wonder what time it was 5,000 miles away. I felt a longing, a raw pain that sharpened itself or became a dull hurt on certain dates and tried to shake off the hollow feeling that I'd forgotten or lost something. Thank you. Ellie, that was beautiful. I can't say it's a privilege to be your editor because I didn't have to actually edit anything you said to me but it's an honor for me to be in the same pages as a Guyana prize winning poet. And uh, I have enjoyed every, every single minute of working with you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you very, very much. It, it, you'll never know how, how wonderful this occasion is for me to read. I'm delighted. Thank you. Um, do I need to introduce David? What can I, what everybody knows who David is. <laughs> David, do I need to introduce you? Have we lost it? Uh, you coming back? Do you want an introduction? Do you want me to sound, make you sound even more important than I've made you sound? Do give him a plug. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, Maria, um, I, I had three copies of the book, uh -huh. and I've given them. I've given. I've given them away. So I, I, I don't have anything on me to read. <laughs> but I just wanted. To, I wanted. To, I wanted to say three things, if I may. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, first of all, I should say, as I said yesterday publicly in an interview I did with um, Jamaican Radio, Caribbean Radio, that this book owes its existence almost entirely to Maria Caladine. And I want to put that on the record. I did not conceive of the book. I did not <laughs> negotiate contracts. I did not find writers. Well, maybe one or two. And I did very little. And Maria Caladine put everything together, uh, including the front cover design, the blurb, everything, the introduction as well. I just went along for the ride. She gave me a free ride. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and um, let me see. Yeah, that, this is why, and I should put it on the record since this is being recorded. This is why we all refer, or some of us refer to Maria as Hurricane Maria because she has an enormous energy, which is um, constructive rather than destructive. Um, two things. My only contribution to this book really was um, um, getting the price lowered from £17 to <laughs> 9 pounds to 9 which meant that it was available to um, us lot, not just them lot, <laughs> if you see what I mean. Um, look. The thing, that unite, the thing that unites all of us, sorry. The thing that unites all of us, irrespective of which country we came from, gender, race, tribe, whatever, what unites all of us was the paraffin heater. What characterizes all the essays in this book is a sense of how cold England was. And the paraffin heater is what united, um, brought us all together um, in giving us a little bit of uh, a warmth. And of course, some of us died because of the paraffin heater of, um, of um, carbon monoxide. So basically, Maria, I hand it back to you. I, I don't really have anything more to say, except that I thoroughly enjoyed reading all the, um, 
all the amazing uh, contributions really varied, you know. Anyway, thanks. No, David, is this is this deliberate? Are you not reading deliberately? Because I'm looking at this, it's so fantastic, Maria. <laughs> so oh, you want me to? You want me to try to get him in line? I can't because I did the same thing when my three copies came. I also gave them away. I walked on Saturday morning. I walked out of my front door. Um, Mr. Eric Huntley lives very close to me, and he yeah. was passing by on his way back from Sainsbury's. So that was one copy. <laughs> So I understand. <laughs> I understand how he's how he's given his copies away, and also I know Juanita, you're thinking this is a brilliant chapter. How can we not have David reading? But I'm wondering if strategically this was quite clever what he's done. Yes. He's go to Oxford and Cambridge, <laughs> and uh, now people are perhaps thinking, oh well, David didn't read. I might buy a copy now, and I was undecided before. Well. So, yeah. I have to just say one glance on page 27 and I'm like, <laughs> I it's want to hear David read this. <laughs> it's very funny. It's, it's really very, very funny. funny. <laughs> it's really very funny. But um, I, 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 um, um, I think we've got to let him off, Juanita. We've got to let David off. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. We, might be able <laughs> we might be able to persuade him back for an encore at some point. Okay. <laughs> We'll let him off and just we'll take a second to admire this lovely portrait of the young David the Younger. Um, because um, you know what, I'll just tell you very briefly David's, um, David's essay, in all seriousness, is a, it's a really beautiful piece because it's about when he in the 80s um, was invited to join the newly formed Caribbean Studies Department at the University of Warwick and he was asked to begin an oral history project. Um, and somebody in the community had told him that there was a man of Indian Guyanese heritage living in Coventry um, whose parents had arrived in Guyana on one of the last ships that brought Indian indentured laborers to Guyana. And it's a beautiful story of how David, um, kind of around the age he is depicted here in this photo, went to find this gentleman who was then very elderly, um, who had come to um, the UK uh, as part of the Windrush generation. And um, it's David recounting the story of his life. Um, and it's really, it is funny, it's hilarious, but it's also very, it's also very sad and very moving yeah. too. And um, I, I know you're gonna enjoy it. Everybody who orders the book, um, I know you're gonna enjoy, um, enjoy reading it. And we will perhaps be able to get David back at some point to, um, uh, um, to read it. But I do encourage everyone, give copies of your books away like David share share the literature i can't frown on him for that so, <laughs> um i had uh, um i had the pleasure the real pleasure of spending many hours with um with mr g who's got it's very interesting to when you're working on anthology every writer has a very different process um mr g um whose family lives very close to me um uh, spent a lot of time with me um while he was going through the process of deciding what he would write and I have to say, as an academic, it was an absolute joy to watch a poet at work and to understand something about the process um, that Mr. G goes through um, when he's bringing together uh, a piece. And his reflection um, on um, his own identity um, as um, as he's reflecting as his, his time as a young man of, um, uh, of African Ugandan and Indian Chinese heritage is really beautiful. And I, I think Mr. G is going to read from his piece for us now. Thanks, Mr. G. Okay, thanks. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. okay, brilliant. Um, yeah, seriously, read, read David's, um, <laughs> David's one because he even. There's a bit in India, there's a bit in Ghana, there's a bit in the UK. So it's like it's the full migration experience when you um when you read that story. It's a very very well written and very moving story indeed. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Maria, for inviting me to be a part of this anthology. Yeah, I really had to to, to dig deep to come up with a story that I felt um reflected me and also reflected the 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 story of another Windrush. So this is a small excerpt from um, the essay that I wrote and it's called Three Rivers. In 1996, I was a carefree young man in my early twenties. I was visiting Port of Spain, Trinidad, 
to immerse myself in the two-day exhaustion known as Carnival. And the song that was on everybody's lips at the time was Jahaji Bai, Brotherhood of the Boat by Brother Marvin. Now, I wasn't Trinidadian, nor was I ever really a big Calypso fan. I grew up on London's cold streets, where any sound that reminded you of sunshine was greeted with skepticism. But I first encountered this unique song at a competition show on Dimash Gras, Carnival Sunday. This is where they crown the Carnival King and Queen and all the top performers attend in the hope of winning that coveted prize. After sitting through several acts whose names have all escaped me, the singer that I was waiting for, Brother Marvin, came out in front of the huge roaring crowd. Dressed in a splendid white and gold outfit, the stage lights flattered his flowing robes. He moved with purpose and seemed to capture an unseen breeze. He was every inch a Calypso star, a charismatic black man, larger than life, deep chocolate skin, original broad nose and dark curls in his hair. He looked like me. And having heard so much about this song, I was desperate to see it performed in front of a live audience. When he grabbed the mic and proceeded to perform, the people went berserk and I understood why. Every syllable of every word of his song bounced around inside my head as I heard something that I'd never heard in my life before. So it is a great privilege to have such unique heritage, 50% Africa, 50% India, India. What did this guy just say? Had he actually written a song drawing on his heritage from two of the oldest people on the earth? Was he really referring to the toxic voyages that brought both Africans and Indians into the Caribbean? Was he trying to find a commonality between slavery and indentureship? And were the crowd actually cheering him on? I couldn't believe it. Because Jahaji Bai wasn't a typical jump up, jump up, party, party song. And yet here everyone was, dancing and singing along. Man, I wish that my friends Ollie and Brian back in London were here to see this. It would blow their minds. I listened in disbelief to this unique plea for black and brown unity so eloquently expressed, so powerfully delivered, and such a convincing sentiment. But did I believe a word of it? Fuck no. <laughs> like the great brother Marvin, I have that unique heritage. 50% African, 50% Indian. My mother was born in Guyana and is of Indian heritage. My father was born in Uganda and is of African heritage. Meanwhile, I was born in England, the land that once colonized both of these countries. So although Uganda and Guyana are totally different, my parents both grew up singing God Save the Queen, drinking Milo, albeit on different sides of the Atlantic. Both countries achieved their independence from Britain during the 1960s. And so both of my parents got to witness and compare pre and post colonial realities. As a result of the British system of indenture, each country has a sizable Indian population living alongside a sizable African population. In Uganda, the Africans are the majority, while in Guyana, the Indians are the majority. And putting it mildly, relations between these two communities in both countries has been traumatic. Jahaji Bai spoke to me because it described an uncomfortable divide that I'd become accustomed to. And up until that day in 1996, I had never heard anyone articulate a reality that was so close to my own personal truth. I look completely African, though you would have to look hard to find any evidence of any mix. In Guyana, all of my family are Indian. In Uganda, all of my family are black. I have African relations who despise Indians and Indian relations who despise Africans. Yet we all go quiet in front of white people. If you go with a black woman, Look how dark your children would be. If you go over Indian man, they'll make sure to cut you out their family tree. Mind those black guys don't rob you on the block. Mind that Indian man doesn't rob you in his shop. We hate them because they hate us. We hate them because they hate us. We hate them because they hate us. Shh, white people are coming. Besides, nobody can cook rice like we. This is the game that we play. Outside the white gaze, black and Indian communities like to pull each other apart. It's our sport to find new names and new ways to look down upon each other. Five years earlier, 
England, 1991. I was at Ollie's house in Streatham, the hangout spot, neutral ground. Ollie was a good friend of mine. He was white and an only child, born and bred in South London. Unfortunately, his parents were in the throes of splitting up as they were divorcing. It was an ugly time for all involved. Ollie was often at home alone, and in order to assuage their guilt, both parents used to shower him with gifts and let him do what he liked. So Ollie had the latest clothes, the newest shoes, the shiniest watch, the best weed, and the new Nintendo game system. This pretty much made his house a mecca for every teenager desperate to escape their own drab bedrooms. One day, I was at Ollie's listening to the current chapter of his disintegrating household when the doorbell rang. Ollie went downstairs to open it and a tall Indian guy rushed in, quite fair skinned with his hair gelled and slicked back to look like a young Michael Corleone. After Godfather and Scarface came on TV, every Indian kid that I met was trying to pass themselves off as Al Pacino. We used to call them Al Patels. Anyway, this guy stormed upstairs, burst into Ollie's room where I was sitting and paused briefly in the doorway to catch his breath. Ollie slowly followed up behind him, smiling that gormless middle-class white boy smile as if to say that his circle of ethnic friends was now complete. It must have been raining outside because this guy's jacket was wet and to my annoyance, he threw himself down upon the remaining space of the couch right next to me and with a panicked yell shouted at Ollie, Quick, bro, turn the TV on, turn the TV on, BBC One, quick. Ollie calmly, calmly picked up the remote control, switched off the game that I was playing and changed the channel to the regular TV. To be honest, this annoyed me even further because I was clocking up quite a high score and I was damn near the final level on that game. Al Patel had fucked up my game. Now I know this was Ollie's house, but I felt like this new dude was encroaching on my space. To break the ice, Ollie rushed through the rudimentary in introductions. Hey, Brian, this is G. G, this is Brian. Me and him work at Blockbuster together. And I told him to pass through. Brian, I thought to myself, I've never met an Indian guy in my life called Brian. So what's the, what's the rush, Brian? I said, shortening his name on purpose. What exactly are we looking for on the TV? With his eyes full of excitement and seemingly hypnotized by the TV screen. Brian uttered five words that would enlighten us all. It's Michael Jackson's new video. That's it. Gee, thank you. Thank you so much for that. That was an excellent reading. And uh, it, it was, as I said, it was an absolute um, pleasure to watch you work. And I, I really learned so much um, from watching uh, how you put that piece together. Thanks very much. Uh, Lainey, um, we're so lucky to have uh, um, to have journalist Lainey Malkani participate um, in this book and I think Lainey for a very long time had wanted to write something about Rudy Narayan um, so that when I invited her to participate her immediate response was that she knew exactly um, what she wanted about to write about and it wasn't a personal story about her own family but it was about someone um, whose life and story had meant a lot to her. Um, so Lainey, I'll let you take it from there. Thank you very much. And um, thank you to all the people who've read. I mean, it's absolutely amazing and um, how rich our stories are and how well people have prepared and read them. So, so congratulations to everyone. But, um, but yes, I shall read a tribute to the life of Rudy Narayan, 1938 to 1998. People followed him because he was a courageous man. Sidgat Kadri QC. I could not pinpoint the exact moment I heard the name Rudy Narayan, but his reputation as a champion fighter against injustice was well known, not just in London where he lived, but across many urban cities in England. In the late 1980s, at the height of Rudy's career, I was a young aspirational journalist who was captivated by his passion to protect those who did not have the means to protect themselves. He was one of my mother's generation. He'd grown up in British Guyana and who traveled to the UK with a sense of hope and adventure, only to find that racial justice and inequality had seeped into every corner of life. Threatening to crush the ambitions of so many people of color, 
everyone except Rudy Narayan, a courageous lawyer who broke the rules to make the rules, who defended black communities against a hostile police force and challenged the law profession to end racial discrimination in its ranks. To fully appreciate the love and respect people have for this fearless civil rights barrister, you need to head to South London. Stand back a little from the bustling Italian cafe on Brixton Road and cast your eyes upwards. There you will find a blue plaque mounted on a red brick Victorian building with the inscription, barrister, civil rights activist, community champion and voice for the voiceless. It was here that Rudy practiced law between 1987 and 1994. The windows, now draped with white net curtains, are a gateway to the past where Rudy set up a law centre that offered free legal advice to the community. He was known as a fearless barrister. He was a thorn in the side of the establishment, lawmakers and police alike. The former cr criminal and immigration barrister Sidgat Kadri QC, who first met Rudy as a student in 1969, a year after Rudy was called to the bar, described him as a great cross-examiner, while leading human rights barrister Michael Mansfield QC went even further when he said that Rudy Narayan could have been the great black barrister of his generation. The plaque has become one of the many treasures of Brixton, South London, with its deep-rooted history of resistance to racial prejudice and injustice. During the 1980s and early 1990s, the area earned its reputation as a place of oppression inflicted on the community by the police and the government. Acute deprivation and underinvestment created a fertile ground for community activism. And as a civil rights barrister, it was the law that Rudy Narayan used to challenge the establishment. His office had an open door policy where members of the community harassed by the police could go and air their grievances. More than that, it also became a refuge for the people of Brixton. The former editor of the Weekly Gleaner, George Ruddock, described Rudy as an outstanding person and his big personality in the area. In 1995, the local police, when local police clashed with police Sorry, in 1995, as local people clashed with the police following the death of Wayne Douglas, George recalled how Rudy's office had become a makeshift newsroom. Our offices were on Acre Lane, which was just down the road from where Rudy's offices were. So when the weekly gleaner was targeted in an arson attack, we had to get out. Rudy stepped in and offered his own premises as a way to ensure that our newspaper could be published. He put people's rights at the forefront and was an advocate for equality and employment. Rodney Hines, now a journalist for the Voice newspaper, recalls meeting Judy in, uh, Rudy in 1982. At the time, he was working for West Indian World, which was one of the first newspapers aimed at an ethnic minority readership owned by the publisher and newspaper proprietor, Arif Ali. Hines described Rudy as a powerful black man in an elite profession. He was fearless and didn't suffer fools gladly. Born in 1938 in Essequibo, British Guyana, Rahasa Rudra Narayan was the ninth child of Sassi Narayan, an Indian landowner, and his wife, Tejaberti. His family emigrated to the UK in 1953 when he was 15 years old. In his youth, he was employed in the variety of small shops, including one of the famous Lions Tea Houses. In 1958, he went on to join the British Army where he remained for seven years and rose to the rank of Sergeant in the Royal Army Ordnance Corps. And when he left in 1965, he set his mind on a new career. He studied law at Lincoln's, House, Lincoln's Inn and was called to the bar in 1968. Sibgat Kadri QC was in his final year of study when Rudy graduated and remembers a more conservative man in those early days. Rudy, he says, came from Guyana, a former British colony, and he joined the British Army, so he believed in the great motherland. He trusted the empire very much, and he thought like the establishment. Within a year, he realized that he trusted the British empire too much. The so-called British flag, its freedoms and citizens were for white people, not for him. In the late 1960s was a time when racial tensions were mounting. The damning effect of Enoch Powell's infamous Rivers of Blood speech delivered in the same year that Rudy graduated laid bare Britain's divided nation. Like paint peeling off a white wall, whitewashed wall to reveal hidden layers of decay, the allure of the motherland was beginning to fade. 
It was a rude awakening, even for Sivgat Kadri QC. It was unimaginable, he said, that the legal profession might be institutionally racist. But in those days, we had very different judges. They were all trained during the empire and they didn't think that black Eurasians were any good. It was from this moment Sivgat Kadri said that Rudy became a leading fighter against institutional racism in the legal profession and the police. And in 1969, together, they set up the Association of Afro, Asian and Caribbean Lawyers, which later became the Society of Black Lawyers. Rasia Ad Amwiza, national co-chair of the Society of Black Lawyers, in a speech reported on the Society of Black Lawyers website, praised their vision and leadership at the unveiling of Rudy's blue plaque in 2010. He explained that the two men were accused by the chairman of the Bar Council at the time of acting divisively and against the traditions of the Bar. They even faced accusations of creating a form of legal apartheid. The irony of his comments, Sir Musa said, is that prior to 1973, only UK citizens could become solicitors and therefore, by excluding ethnic minority lawyers on the basis of this citizenship test, the legal profession had itself been operating a form of apartheid for hundreds of years. As a civil rights lawyer, Rudy's name quickly became associated with an uncompromising and determined fight for racial justice. He passionately defended those who were victimized, who were considered to be the underdogs of society and the poor. Thank you.